it's Mrs. Shots here. Now, this video is for my wolves group. As promised, I'm going to read the last few chapters, except for the last, of Dead House for you guys. So on Tuesday, October 20th, when we're back together, we will finish this book Oh my gosh, we've been reading it for so many weeks now, but you guys have loved it and I have loved it and it's been creepy and weird and gross and so much fun. So we left off at the end of chapter 13 with Amanda finding out that Ray and all the kids they've been hanging out with are actually dead and they're ghosts. And we also learned that the whole town is dead and they feed on fresh blood. That's how they stay alive. So Amanda and her family were lured to their Dark Falls town and lured into Dead House. And we ended chapter 13 with Amanda seeming like she was going to die. Ray had a glow in his eyes. He was floating over top of her. She felt like she was choking and she thought she might be dead. Now, chapter 14. Are you ready? I know I am. And then, suddenly, light broke through the darkness. The light shone in Ray's face, the bright white halogen light. Remember, that's the type of flashlight Josh had. What's going on? Josh asked in a high-pitched, nervous voice. Amanda, what's happening? Ray cried out and dropped back to the ground. Turn that off! Turn that off! He screeched his voice a shrill whisper like a wind through a broken window pane. But Josh held the bright beam of light on Ray. What's going on? What are you doing? I could breathe again. As I stared into the light, I struggled to stop my heart from pounding so hard. Ray moved his arms to shield himself from the light, but I could see what was happening to him. The light had already done its damage. Ray's skin seemed to be melting. His whole face sagged and then fell, dropping off his skull. <gasps> oh, man. So the light of their flashlight, that must be why Ray was carrying a hat around. Oh, interesting. And that also makes me think of Amanda's nightmare with the skin falling off. I stared into the circle of white light, unable to look away as Ray's skin folded and drooped and melted away. As the bone underneath was revealed, his eyeballs rolled out of their sockets and fell silently to the ground. Josh, frozen in horror, somehow held the bright light steady and we both stared at the grinning skull, its dark craters staring back at us. Oh, I shrieked as Ray took a step toward me, but then I realized that Ray wasn't walking, he was falling. I jumped aside as he crumpled to the ground and gasped as his skull hit the top of the marble gravestone and cracked open with a sickening splat. Come on, Josh shouted. Amanda, come on. He grabbed my hand and tried to pull me away, but I couldn't stop staring down at Ray, now a pile of bones inside a puddle of crumpled clothes. Amanda, come on. Then before I even realized it, I was running running beside Josh as fast as I could down the long row of graves toward the street. The light flashed against the blur of gravestones as we ran, slipping on the soft dew-covered grass, gasping in the still hot air. We've got to tell Mom and Dad, got to get away from here, I cried. They, they won't believe it, Josh said as we reached the street. He kept running, our sneakers thudding hard against the pavement. I'm not sure I believe it myself. They've got to believe us, I told him. If they don't, we'll drag them out of the house. The white beam of light pointed the way as we ran through the dark, silent streets. There were no street lights, no lights on the windows of the houses we passed, no car headlights. Such a dark world we had entered, and now it was time to get out. Oh, interesting. I guess there's no lights because lights, it seems like, kill the ghosts. I don't know if Ray is if Ray is dead dead or maybe we'll see him again. I'm not sure. We ran the rest of the way home 
I kept looking back to see if we were being followed, but I didn't see anyone. The neighborhood was still and empty. I had a sharp pain in my side as we reached home, but I forced myself to keep running up the gravel driveway with its thick blanket of dead leaves and onto the front porch. I pushed open the door and both Josh and I started to scream, Mom! Dad! Where are you? Silence. We ran into the living room. The lights were all off. Mom! Dad! Are you here? Please be here, I thought, my heart racing, the pain in my side still sharp. Please be here. We searched the house. They weren't home. The party! Josh suddenly remembered. Can they still be at that party? We were standing in the living room, both of us breathing hard. The pain in my side had bled up just a bit. I had turned on all the lights, but the room still felt gloomy and menacing. I glanced at the clock on the mantel. Nearly two in the morning. They should be home by now, I said, my voice shaky and weak. Where did they go? Did they leave a number? Josh was already on his way to the kitchen. I followed him, turning on lights as we went. We went right to the memo pad on the counter where mom and dad always leave us notes. Nothing. The pad was blank. We've got to find them, Josh cried. He sounded very frightened. His wide eyes reflected his fear. We've got to get away from here. What if something has happened to them? That's what I started to say, but I caught myself just in time. I didn't want to scare Josh any more than he was already. Plus, he probably thought of that too. Should we call the police? He asked as we walked back to the living room and peered out the front window into the darkness. I don't know, I said, pressing my hot forehead against the cool glass. I just don't know what to do. I want them to be home. I want them to be here so we all can leave. What's your hurry? A girl's voice said from behind me. Josh and I both cried out and spun around. Karen Somerset was standing in the center of the room, her arms crossed over her chest. But you're dead, I blurted out. She smiled, a sad smile, a bitter smile. Bitter means uh, like, kind of like you're upset at someone for something. Or you're mad that something has happened to you. So maybe she's bitter that she's dead and she's a ghost. And then two more kids stepped in from the hallway. One of them clicked off the lights. Too bright in here, he said. They moved next to Karen. Then another dead kid, Jerry Franklin, appeared by the fireplace. And I saw the girl with short black hair, the one I had seen on the stairs, move beside me by the curtains. They were all smiling their eyes glowing dully in the dim light, all moving in on Josh and me. What do you want? I screamed in a voice I didn't even recognize. What are you going to do? We used to live in your house, Karen said softly. Huh? I cried. We used to live in your house, George said. And now, guess what? Jerry added. Now we're dead in your house. The others started to laugh, crackling, dry laughs, as they all closed in on Josh and me. Now, that's the end of chapter 14. Here's chapter 15. They're going to kill us, Josh cried. I watched them move forward in silence. Josh and I had backed up to the window. I looked around the dark room for an escape route, but there was nowhere to run. Karen, you seem so nice, I said. The words just tumbled out. I hadn't thought before I said them. Her eyes glowed a little brighter. I was nice, she said in a glum monotone, until I moved here. A monotone is a tone that is the same all the way through. Nothing really changes. It kind of sounds like this. We were all nice, George Carpenter said in the same low monotone. But now we're dead. Let us go, Josh cried, raising his hands in front of him as if to shield himself. Please, let us go. They laughed again, the dry, hoarse laughter. Dead laughter. Don't be scared, Amanda, Karen said. Soon you'll be with us. That's why they invited you to this house. Huh? I, I don't understand, I cried, my voice shaking. This is the dead house. This is where everyone lives when they first arrive in Dark Falls when they're still alive. This seemed to strike the others as funny. They all snickered and laughed. But our great uncle, Josh started. Karen shook her head. 
her eyes glowing with amusement. That means she thinks something's funny. No, sorry Josh, no great uncle. It was just a trick to bring you here. Once every year, someone new has to move here. Other years it was us. We lived in this house until we died. This year, it's your turn. We need new blood, Jerry Franklin said, his eyes glowing red in the dim light. Once a year, you see, we need new blood. Moving forward in silence, they hovered over Josh and me. I took a deep breath, a last breath perhaps, and shut my eyes. And then I heard a knock at the door. A loud knock, repeated several times. I opened my eyes. The ghostly kids had all vanished. The air smelled sour. Hmm, I want to think about what sour air smells like. Do you think it smells like Sour Patch Candy? No, if the air smells sour, it probably kind of stings your nose a little bit. It's probably really stinky and ooh, strange. Josh and I stared at each other, dazed, as the loud knocking started again. It's mom and dad, Josh cried. We both ran to the door. Josh stumbled over the coffee table in the dark, so I got to the door first. Mom, dad, I cried, pulling open the door. Where have you been? I reached out my arms to hug them both and stopped with my arms in the air. My mouth dropped open and I uttered a silent cry. Mr. Dawes, Josh exclaimed, coming up beside me. We thought... Oh, Mr. Dawes, I'm so glad to see you, I cried happily, pushing open the screen door for him. Hmm. Kids, you're okay, he asked, eyeing us both, his handsome face tight with worry. Oh, thank God, I got here in time, he said. Mr. Dawes, I started feeling so relieved. I had tears in my eyes. I, he grabbed my arm. There's no time to talk, he said, looking behind him to the street. I could see his car in the driveway. The engine was running. Only the parking lights were on. I've got to get you kids out of here while there's still time. Josh and I started to follow him, then hesitated. What if Mr. Dawes was one of them? Hurry, Mr. Dawes urged, holding open the screen door, gazing nervously out into the darkness. I think we're in terrible danger. But I started, staring into his frightened eyes, trying to decide if we could trust him. I was at the party with your parents, Mr. Dawes said. All of a sudden, they formed a circle. Everyone around your parents and me, they, they started to close in on us. Just like when the kids started to close in on Josh and me, I thought. We broke through them and ran, Mr. Dawes said, glancing to the driveway behind him. Somehow the three of us got away. Hurry, we've all got to get away from here now. Josh, let's go, I urged. Then I turned to Mr. Dawes. Where are mom and dad? Come on, I'll show you. They're safe for now, but I don't know for how long. We followed him out of the house and down the driveway to his car. The clouds had parted. A silver moon shone low in a pale early morning sky. There's something wrong with this whole town, Mr. Dawes said, holding the front passenger door open for me as Josh climbed into the back. I slumped gratefully into the seat and he slammed the door shut. I know, I said as he slid behind the wheel. Josh and I, we both, we've got to get as far away as we can before they catch up with us, Mr. Dawes said, backing down the drive quickly, the tires sliding and squealing as he pulled onto the street. Yes, I, I agreed. Thank goodness you came. My house, it's filled with kids, dead kids, and... So you've seen them, Mr. Dawes said softly, his eyes wide with fear. He pushed down harder on the gas pedal. As I looked out into the purple darkness, a low orange sun began to show over the green treetops. Where are our parents? I asked anxiously. There's a kind of outdoor theater next to the cemetery, Mr. Dawes said, staring straight ahead through the windshield, his eyes narrow, his expression tense. It's built right into the ground, and it's hidden by a big tree. I left them there. I told them not to move. I think they'll be safe. I don't think anyone will think to look there. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that where they were when they found, when Ray told them about everything? <gasps> We've seen it, Josh said. A bright light suddenly flashed on in the back seat. What's that? Mr. Dawes asked, looking into the rearview mirror. 
My flashlight, Josh answered, clicking it off. I brought it just in case, but the sun will be up soon. I probably won't need it. Mr. Dawes hit the brake and pulled the car to the side of the road. We were at the edge of the cemetery. I climbed quickly out of the car, eager to see my parents. The sky was still dark, streaked with violet now. The sun was a dark orange balloon, just barely poking over the trees. Across the street, beyond the jagged rows of gravestones, I could see the dark outline of the leaning tree that hid the mysterious amphitheater. Hurry, Mr. Dawes urged, closing his car door quietly. I'm sure your parents are desperate to see you. We headed across the street, half walking, half jogging, Josh swinging the flashlight in one hand. Suddenly, at the edge of the cemetery grass, Josh stopped. Petey, he cried. I followed his gaze and saw our white terrier walking slowly along a slope of gravestones. Petey! Josh yelled again and began running to the dog. My heart sank. I hadn't had a chance to tell Josh what Ray had revealed to me about Petey. No, Josh! I called. Mr. Dawes looked very alarmed. We don't have time. We have to hurry, he said to me. Then he began shouting for Josh to come back. Do you remember what Ray said happened to Petey? I'll go get him, I said, and I took off running as fast as I could along the rows of graves, calling to my brother. Josh, Josh, wait up. Don't, don't go after him, Josh. Petey's dead. Josh had been gaining on the dog, which was ambling along, sniffing the ground, not looking up, not paying any attention to Josh. Then suddenly, Josh tripped over a low grave marker. He cried out as he fell, and the flashlight flew out of his hand and clattered against a gravestone. I quickly caught up with him. Josh, are you okay? He was lying on his stomach, staring straight ahead. Josh, answer me, are you okay? I grabbed him by the shoulders and tried to pull him up, but he kept staring straight ahead, his mouth open, his eyes wide. Josh, look, he said finally. I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that Josh wasn't knocked out or something. Look, he repeated and pointed to the gravestone he had tripped over. I turned and squinted at the grave. I read the inscription, silently mouthing the words as I read. Compton Dawes, 1966 to 1996. My head began to spin. I felt dizzy. I steadied myself, holding on to Jaws, holding on to Josh. Compton Dawes. It wasn't his father or grandfather. He had told us he was the only Compton in his family. So Mr. Dawes was dead too. Dead, dead, dead. Dead as everyone else. He was one of them. One of the dead ones. Josh and I stared at each other in the purple darkness. Surrounded. Surrounded by the dead. Now what? I asked myself. Now what? That's the end of chapter 15. So we've got two more chapters to go until our last chapter. Stay tuned. All right, it's time for chapter 16. Get up, Josh, I said, my voice a choked whisper. We've got to get away from here. But we were too late. A hand grabbed me firmly by the shoulder. I spun around to see Mr. Dawes, his eyes narrowing as he read the inscription on his own gravestone. Mr. Dawes, you too, I cried, so disappointed, so confused, so scared. Me too, he said almost sadly all of us. His eyes burned into mine. This was a normal town once, and we were normal people. Most of us worked in the plastics factory on the outskirts of town. Then there was an accident. Something escaped from the factory. A yellow gas. It floated over the town so fast we didn't see it, didn't realize. And then it was too late, and Dark Falls wasn't a normal town anymore. We were all dead Amanda, dead and buried, but we couldn't rest, couldn't sleep. Dark Falls was a town of the living dead. What, what are you gonna do with us? I managed to ask. My knees were trembling so hard I could barely stand. A dead man was squeezing my shoulder. A dead man was staring into my eyes. Standing this close, I could smell his sour breath. I turned my head, but the smell already choked my nostrils. Where are mom and dad? Josh asked, climbing to his feet and standing rigidly across from us, glaring accusingly at Mr. Dawes. Safe and sound, Mr. Dawes said with a faint smile. Come with me. It's time for you to join them. 
I tried to pull away from him, but his hand was locked on my shoulder. Let go, I shouted. His smile grew wider. Amanda, it doesn't hurt to die, he said softly, almost soothingly. Come with me. No, Josh shouted, and with sudden quickness, he dived to the ground and picked up his flashlight. Yes, I cried. Shine it on him, Josh. The light could save us. The light could defeat Mr. Dawes as it has Ray. The light could destroy him. Quick, shine it on him, I pleaded. Josh fumbled with the flashlight, then pointed it toward Mr. Dawes' startled face and clicked it on. Nothing. No light. It, it's broken, Josh said. I, I guess w when I hit the gravestone, my heart pounding, I looked back at Mr. Dawes. The smile on his face was a smile of victory. Oh my goodness, I can't believe the flashlight didn't work. I really thought for a minute there that they were going to be able to defeat Mr. Dawes. I even thought that, oh, if they get Mr. Dawes with the flashlight, then they can get everybody else and everything's going to be fine. I did not see that coming. Okay, chapter 17. Now this is the last one for this video. Chapter 18 is the last chapter and we're going to read that together on Tuesday. Nice try, Mr. Dawes said to Josh. The smile faded quickly from his face. Close up, he didn't look so young and handsome. His skin, I could see, was dry and peeling and hung loosely beneath his eyes. Let's go, kids, he said, giving me a shove. He glanced up at the brightening sky. The sun was raising itself over the treetops. Josh hesitated. I said, let's go, Mr. Dawes snapped impatiently. He loosened his grip on my shoulder and took a menacing step toward Josh. Josh glanced down at the worthless flashlight. Then he pulled his arm back and heaved the flashlight at Mr. Dawes's head. The flashlight hit its target with the sickening crack. It hit Mr. Dawes in the center of his forehead, splitting a large hole in the skin. Mr. Dawes uttered a low cry. His eyes widened in surprise. Dazed, he reached a hand up to the hole where a few inches of gray skull poked through. Run, Josh, I cried, but there was no need to tell him that. He was already zigzagging through the rows of graves, his head ducked low. I followed him, running as fast as I could. Glancing back, I saw Mr. Dawes stagger after us, still holding his ripped forehead. He took several steps, then abruptly stopped, staring at the sky. Ooh, I love that word, abruptly. So if something is abrupt, it is sudden. So if he abruptly stopped, he suddenly stopped. It's too bright for him, I realized. He has to stay in the shade. Josh had ducked down behind a tall marble monument, old and slightly tilted, cracked down the middle. I slid down beside him, gasping for breath. Leaning on the cool marble, we both peered around the sides of the monument. Mr. Dawes, a scowl on his face, was heading back toward the amphitheater, keeping in the shadows of the trees. He's, he's not chasing us, Josh whispered, his chest heaving as he struggled to catch his breath and stifle his fear. You're stifling something. You're trying to put it out or push it down. He's going back. The sun is too bright for him, I said, holding on to the side of the monument. He must be going to get mom and dad. That stupid flashlight, Josh cried. Never mind that, I said, watching Mr. Dawes until he disappeared behind the big leaning tree. What are we going to do now? I don't know. Shh, look. Josh poked me hard on the shoulder and pointed. Who's that? I followed his stare and saw several dark figures hurrying through the rows of tombstones. They seemed to have appeared from out of nowhere. Did they rise out of the graves? Walking quickly, they seemed to float over the green, sloping ground. They headed to the shadows. All were walking in silence, their eyes straight ahead. They didn't stop to greet one another. They strode purposefully toward the hidden amphitheater as if they were being drawn there, as if they were puppets being pulled by hidden strings. Whoa, look at them all, Josh whispered, ducking his head back behind the marble monument. The dark moving forms made all the shadows ripple. It looked as if the trees, the gravestones, the entire cemetery had come to life. He started toward the hidden seats of the amphitheater. There goes Karen, I whispered, pointing, and George, and all the rest of them. The kids from our house are moving quickly in twos and threes,
following the other shadows as silent and businesslike as everyone else. Everyone was here except Ray, I thought, because we killed Ray. We killed someone who was already dead. Do you think mom and dad are really down in that weird theater? Josh asked, interrupting my morbid thoughts, his eyes on the moving shadows. Come on, I said, taking Josh's hand and pulling him away from the monument. We've got to find out. We watched the last of the dark figures float past the enormous leaning tree. The shadows stopped moving. The cemetery was still and silent. A solitary crow floated high above in the clear blue cloudless sky. Now solitary just means one, alone. If you're solo, solitary, you're alone, one. Slowly, Josh and I edged our way toward the amphitheater, ducking behind gravestones, keeping low to the ground. It was a struggle to move. I felt as if I weighed 500 pounds, the weight of my fear, I guess. I was desperate to see if mom and dad were there, but at the same time, I didn't want to see. I didn't want to see them held prisoner by Mr. Dawes and the other. I didn't want to see them killed. I didn't, the, the thought made me stop. I reached out an arm and halted Josh. We were standing behind the leaning tree, hidden by its enormous clump of upraised roots. Beyond the tree, down in the theater below, I could hear the low murmur of voices. Are mom and dad there? Josh whispered. He started to poke his head around the side of the bent tree trunk, but I cautiously pulled him back. Be careful, I whispered. Don't let them see you. They're practically right beneath us. But I've got to know if mom and dad are really here, he whispered, his eyes frightened pleading. Now if you're pleading, you're begging. Me too, I agreed. We both leaned over the massive trunk. The bark felt smooth under my hands as I gazed into the deep shadows cast by the tree. And then I saw them, mom and dad. They were tied up, back to back, standing in the center of the floor at the bottom of the amphitheater in front of everyone. They looked so uncomfortable, so terrified. Their arms were tied down tightly at their sides. Dad's face was bright red. Mom's hair was all messed up, hanging wildly down over her forehead. Her head bowed, squinting into the darkness. Cast by the tree, I saw Mr. Dawes standing beside them, along with another older man. And I saw that the rows of long benches built into the ground were filled with people. Not a single empty space. Everyone in town must be here, I realized. Everyone except Josh and me. They're going to kill mom and dad, Josh whispered, grabbing my arm, squeezing it in fear. They're going to make mom and dad just like them. Then they'll come after us, I said, thinking out loud, staring through the shadows at my poor parents. Both of them had their heads bowed now as they stood be before the silent crowd. Both of them were awaiting their fate. What are we going to do, Josh whispered. Huh? I was staring so hard at mom and dad, I guess I momentarily blanked out. What are we going to do? Josh repeated urgently, still holding desperately onto my arm. We just can't stand here and... I suddenly knew what we were going to do. It just came to me. I didn't even have to think hard. Maybe we can save them, I whispered back, backing away from the tree. Maybe we can do something. Josh let go of my arm. He stared at me eagerly. eagerly. We're going to push this tree over. I whispered with so much confidence that I surprised myself. We're going to push this tree over so the sunlight will fill the amphitheater. Yes, Josh cried immediately. Look at this tree. It's practically down already. We can do it. I knew we could do it. I don't know where my confidence came from, but I knew we could do it. And I knew we had to do it fast. Peering over the top of the trunk again, struggling to see through the shadows, I could see that everyone in the theater had stood up. They were all starting to move forward, down toward mom and dad. Come on, Josh, I whispered. We'll take a running jump and push the tree over. Come on. Without another word, we both took several steps back. We just had to give the trunk a good, hard push, and the tree would topple right over. The roots were already almost entirely up out of the ground after all. One hard push, that's all it would take, and the sunlight would pour into the theater. Beautiful, glowing sunlight. Bright, bright sunlight. The dead people would all crumble, and Mom and Dad would be saved. 
All four of us would be saved. Come on, Josh, I whispered. Ready? He nodded, his face solemn, his eyes frightened. If your face is solemn, it's very serious. Okay, let's go, I cried. We both ran forward, digging our sneakers into the ground, moving as fast as we could, our arms outstretched and ready. In a second, we hit the tree trunk and pushed with all of our strength, shoving it with our hands and then moving our shoulders into it, pushing, pushing, pushing. It didn't budge. And that's the end of chapter 17. Oh my gosh! Are they going to be able to save their mom and dad? Are they going to get the tree pushed down? Is the sunlight going to kill the ghosts? Are they all going to die? I don't know. And neither do you. And you're going to have to wait until Tuesday to find out. I'm going to be sad when this book is over. We've had so much fun reading it together. We've learned so many new vocabulary words. We've talked about characters character traits. We've talked about foreshadowing. We've made predictions. It has been so much fun and I can't wait to finish this book with you guys on Tuesday. All right. Bye.